Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Um, can you please take your seats and turn your phones off or put them on silent mode uh, as we get ready to start our second panel session this morning? And can you please give a very warm welcome to our panel chair, John Dorney, editor of the Irish Story website. Thanks very much. And Welcome back to everybody. Um, we've got a very interesting panel, and the panel is on the Civil War in Kerry, which is, as I imagine, where many of us are here today. So the Civil War, as we heard a little bit in the first panel, was particularly brutal and particularly bitter. Now, our first talker is a great historian, Dahi O'Koran. He is a native of Kalorglin, but he works at the School of History and Geography at Dublin City University. So in his early career, he focused on religion in Irish history, including several books, including Rendering to God and Caesar, Irish Churches in the Two States in Ireland. More recently, he has focused more on the Irish Revolutionary Period, and he and Eunor O'Halpin produced a very useful book, The Dead of the Irish Revolution, which documented all the dead from 1916 up to 1921. So, um, his most recent book is a biography of Cahal Brewer, who we heard from Liz Gillis about in the opening session, who was of course killed in the first week of the Civil War. But today, he's going to be talking about County Kerry. And the topic of his talk is Bullocks, Provisions and Motor Cars, Compensation Claims for Commandeered Property During the Civil War in Kerry. So, Dahi O'Croft. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks, John, for that warm introduction. Uh, last night, Dermot Ferreter revealed the extraordinary richness of the military service pension collection. Uh, in terms of the light that it sheds on the grim legacies and disappointments experienced by ordinary men and women. Uh, so, uh, in this session, or in this paper, I want to look at the themes of trauma and loss from an economic perspective by exploring how the Civil War occasioned significant material loss and hardship for individuals, families, and businesses. And this draws on a, a new research project that I uh, have embarked on. Now, between 1916 and 1923, there were a number of compensation schemes. They are a treasure trove for the historian because claimants had to record what material possessions were lost, where, when, and under what circumstances. 1916 damages were addressed by the Property Losses Ireland Committee and the bill was picked up by the British Treasury. The Criminal and Malicious Injuries Act covered uh, claims during the War of Independence uh, and th these costs were levied on county councils. For those who fled Ireland or were regarded as loyalist, the British government operated the Irish Grants Committee and Jim Clark, who's a, an expert on this, will be uh, speaking to us tomorrow. The Damage to Property Compensation Act 1923, the subject of my paper, dealt with the Civil War period. This legislation was necessary to relieve local authorities of legal liabilities for Civil War damage, and because the Free State Government wanted the British Government to pay for War of Independence losses. Almost as soon as the uh, intense conflict in Dublin abated in early July 1922, a government committee investigated the issue of restitution. It was chaired by this man here, Ernest Blythe, who was then Minister for Agriculture, and he was the future and notoriously flinty Minister for Finance. The Damage to Property Act became law in May 1923, and it covered losses between the truce on the 11th of July 1921 and the 12th, up to and including the 12th of uh, May 1923. The Act excluded death and personal injury, which were assigned to a separate commission, the records of which lay in the basement in Merrion Square for over a century, until Pascal Donoghue transferred them to the National Archives of Ireland in November for digitization. Now, the transfer involved 3,500 files which cover the War of Independence and the Civil War. When they become available, they will transform our understanding of the human toll of the Civil War in particular. Also excluded from the Damage to Property Act were compensation claims by anti-treaty IRA activists. Now, they had to wait until Fianna Fáil came to power in the 1930s. No awards were made for the loss of cash unless, of course, you were a bank. Uh, 
The loss of ornamental jewellery, chattels, wat watches, that sort of thing, uh, were also excluded, unless it was part of a business's stock and trade. Neither was there uh, compensation for consequential losses, such as loss of business. Therefore, a manufacturer could be compensated for his or her machinery, but not for the loss of business. The vast majority of applications for compensation were lodged in 1923 and paid uh, in 1924. All awards were subject to the approval of the Minister for Finance before payment was authorised. And, in a minority of cases, the Minister challenged the size of those awards. The state did not have sufficient funds to make cash awards, and a portion of larger compensation awards was paid in government securities. Now, given the intensity and the duration of the civil war in Kerry, it is unsurprising that the initial number of claims was very large. Now, you get a better sense of this from the table you can see on screen. As the screen indicates, Dublin city and county occupied first place with over 2,700 claims for a whopping 2.1 million. Now, the reasons for this, of course, have been expertly outlined for us this morning by Liz in her paper on the battle for Dublin. Kerry was second, with over 2,000 claims, which sought a combined 1.7 million. Now, these figures were simply enormous for a government stretched to its limits financially. In the 1920s, the average tax revenue of the Irish Free State was about 25 million. Out of this, they had to repay the land annuities under the various land acts. They came to about 5 million per annum. The cost of paying RIC pensions, judicial and civil service pensions, under the treaty was another 2.25 million, and that's before we come to the cost of the old age pension, which um, was about 3 million a year. Policing, another uh, 1.1 million. And that's before we get to the millions that were required to pay for the bloated size of the National Army before demobilization. So this is a long-winded way of saying that, given this financial context, the priority for the government in terms of civil war compensation was to minimise the number of admissible claims and then to minimise the size of the actual awards. Now, a central role in that task of minimisation was played by the state's solicitor for each county. They acted in the interest of the government. In June 1923, W.T. Cosgrave um, set out the bleak financial situation, and he impressed on state solicitors their responsibility to make preliminary investigations and to oppose claims in court. Unlike 1916, when compensation was granted on a similar basis to insurance, the 1923 measure was adversarial, with claims heard before the local county court, which from 1924 became the local circuit court. The system favoured the better off, who could afford to engage a solicitor to present the, uh, their case. Terence J. Liston, with offices on Denny Street here in Tralee, was the Kerry State Solicitor, and he proved excellent at his job. About 800 uh, claims from Kerry were very, very quickly rejected. A majority of cases were heard by E.J. McElligot, originally from Listowel, who was appointed circuit court judge for the counties of Clare, Limerick and Kerry in 1924. T.J. Liston vigorously defended the interests of the taxpayer and the state. For example, Thomas Brosnan of Lack Fooder in Castle Island sought £80 for a rick of turf that was destroyed in June 1922. Liston argued, and did so successfully, that the basis for compensation should be calculated only on the cost of production. The judge agreed, and Brosnan was awarded £32 instead of the £80 that he had originally sought. Now, the judges themselves also criticised some applications. For example, Matthew Sullivan of Drumtacker in Tralee claimed £21 for the destruction of a fence, a damage to a horse and furniture in Ardfert. He was awarded just 10 shillings, with his honour remarking that the amount claimed was, quote, ridiculous. Now, the individual claims themselves are absolutely fascinating. They can be divided, or in, I'm going to try and divide them for the purpose of this paper, into the following broad categories. Damage to or destruction of buildings. Businesses' stock and trade, 
motor cars, bicycles and other modes of transport, livestock and provisions. And I want to give you a flavour uh, of some of these uh, claims. Many of the claims for damage to houses and business premises pertained to the urban phase of the Civil War in Kerry in August and September 1922, when the National Army captured Tralee, Killarney, Castle Island and Killorglan. And then there was a sort of response from the uh, anti-treaty IRA, which retook Kinmare and attempted to do the same in Killorglan on the 27th of September. Now, in Killorglan, the National Army occupied uh, the barracks, that's the blue building you can see there on screen, as well as some other buildings in the town, such as the Bianconi Inn and the Carnegie Library. The IRA attempted, attempted to burrow through houses on Upper Bridge Street in an attempt to take the barracks. Okay, so um, that's Upper Bridge Street, and the house we're really interested in is the orange building next uh, to uh, the barracks. That was the home and the small shop of Hannah Dodd, a widow in her late 60s. A mine was placed at the party wall between Mrs. Dodd's house and the barracks, uh, but the explosion blew back into Mrs. Dodd's house and destroyed it. On the 13th of December 1922, uh, Mrs. Dodd made a claim for £1,277 for structural damage to the building and almost £400 for the looting of the contents of her home and shop. Now, judges have the power to attach full or partial reinstatement conditions to some awards. Full reinstatement meant that the new or repaired building had to be of the same character as the building that was damaged. Uh, and in Mrs. Dodd's case, a decree was issued in November 1923 for £730 plus £18 in cost with a reinstatement condition. So £580 had to be spent on rebuilding uh, or repairing her property. Now, to recoup uh, debts that were owed to the state or the local government, and to keep claims uh, as low as possible, the revenue commissioners were called on to check that claimants were not in arrears of local rates or their income tax or behind in their mortgage. Now, the, uh, so Mrs. Dodd's claim, um, or the claims then were, ge were generally signed off by the Secretary of the Department of Finance, which at this time was this man here, Joe Brennan, uh, from uh, Bandon in, uh, in West Cork. Now, uh, in terms of arrears, Mrs. Dodd was a conscientious citizen. She was not, everything was in order. Uh, and on screen, we can see a, a reinstatement certificate dated May 1925. Unfortunately, however, Mrs. Dodd did not live to see this document. She was not old enough for the old age pension. You had to be 70 to qualify for the old age pension. Um, which raises the question, how did she spend her final years? Where did she spend them? Uh, now, there are several similar claims pertaining to other towns in Kerry. For some of the grander houses destroyed, the awards were insufficient to cover the cost of rebuilding. Colonel Edward Nash, for example, appealed against an award for £1,300 instead of the 6000 that he was looking for for the burning of Ballycarthy House near Tralee in January 1923. The award that he had received was less than half of the estimated cost required to rebuild, and for that reason, Ballycarthy remained in ruins. Now, several claims uh, uh, came from the employees of the Great Southern and Western Railway, who worked on the various lines in Kerry, most of which were closed for the duration of the war. So that's uh, just a, 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 an engine. And this map here shows uh, the dense network of lines and, sub and stations uh, in Kerry at this time. And here we see a monument in Killorglan uh, to the Farron Four uh, to Valencia Line. Now, the most serious inc incident, something John referred to in his paper, uh, was the derailment uh, of a train at Lascahan near Ardfert. So a goods train was derailed instead of the expected troop train, uh, and the engine driver who was from uh, Tralee was killed, uh, and his fireman died of injuries. Now, many families were placed in great hardship by the loss of income due to the closure of the railway lines. So it wasn't like COVID, people did not continue to get paid. Um, when the railways ceased, 
then people's income also ceased. So Dennis Galvin, an engine driver from Tralee, claimed £65 for the loss of his £5 a week uh, wage between August and November 1922. So Dennis was on good money. Uh, now, no award was made to, uh, to him and to many others in a similar, very difficult predicament, as the railways were considered a special category outside the scope uh, of the legislation uh, and were deemed to be unsuitable for consideration at county court. As you might expect, a significant number of claims uh, pertaining to motor cars, motorcycles and bicycles were received. Modes of conveyance commandeered by the National Army were sent to the Commandeered Motor Vehicles Adjudication Committee at Army Headquarters. Just as for damage to buildings, the full amount claimed was rarely, uh, if ever, awarded. Now, Michael J. Sullivan of Carsevine applied for £360 for his bright blue Maxwell motor car, just like the one you can see on screen, which was seized in Carsevine in July 1922. The judge recommended £55 with costs, to which O'Sullivan agreed in November 1924. But first, he had to clear his arrears uh, in rates of £6. Now, the Maxwell was a popular American automobile, and the company was eventually taken over by Chrysler in the 1920s. A newer Maxwell, an 18-horsepower model, uh, belonging to John Foreman of London and Cork, was taken uh, from the garage of this uh, fine hotel at Park Nasilla. Now, Foreman was awarded £90 plus expenses. Half of this amount was in cash and half in government securities. Bicycles were also often commandeered. Richard Blenner Hassett, a farmer from Calner Fersey outside Milltown, sought £42 for the loss of a gent's BSA bicycle and accoutrements, just like the one there you can see on screen, and here is a, a real live uh, version. Now, unusually in this case, Terence J. Liston uh, swapped sides. He represented uh, Blenner Hassett uh, in his case, and the state was represented uh, by the state solicitor for West Cork. And this was worth it for Blenner Hassett. He received £25 plus costs of £9. A significant portion of Kerry claims were for livestock, either seized and carried off or killed in crossfire between the National Army and the anti-treaty IRA. For example, Redmond Keating, Honorary Secretary of Tralee Golf Course secured uh, just over three pounds for a sheep killed while it was grazing, minding its own business, on the club's land at Oak Park uh, in September 1922. Uh, Michael Jones, a, a labourer from Ballybunion, was not so fortunate when seeking 15 pounds for the loss of a milch cow on the 12th of September, just like the fine Kerry cow you can see on screen. The animal was killed uh, when the National Army was sniped while performing searches in Ballybunion. Jones's case, and he was not, he didn't have the money to be represented by a solicitor, his case was dismissed on the grounds that the crossfire could not be proven, and to compound matters, costs were awarded against the poor man. A sense of lawlessness is evident in the claims of business owners and company representatives. Um, in Kerry, in 1922, there was no such thing as a free pair of underpants. Therefore, uh, Joanna McKenna sought £12 uh, for the loss of undershirts, caps, drawers, towels, and a hat and handkerchief uh, combination set seized from her shop on the main street in Dingle in August 1922. She was awarded uh, £6.18 and, uh, and costs of just over £5. Similarly, James Mulcahy, who owned a boot shop in Killarney, was granted £15 and £8 expenses uh, for the theft of 24 pairs of gentlemen's boots, which were commandeered by the anti-treaty IRA in August 1922. All sorts of foodstuffs were commandeered, and many uh, businesses and companies suffered significant financial losses. Edward Pearson Brown, who was secretary of a well-known biscuit manufacturer, uh, Cars of Carlisle, the same cars that exist today, um, had no success when he sought seven pounds compensation for the loss of packets of assorted biscuits in Carsevine, in what looked like an opportunity crime by a sweet-toothed criminal. 
extensive local companies, uh, such as Jeremiah Slattery's here in Tralee, um, uh, suffered repeated losses of goods. There were multiple instances, for example, where boxes of Slattery's butter were seized and destroyed throughout the duration of the Civil War. Petrol, or to use the term used at the time, motor spirit, was another highly sought after commodity. The Anglo-American Oil Company made 11 claims for the theft of petrol commandeered in Listole, Ratmore and Carsevine of which only six claims were admitted because they were strongly challenged by Liston as to whether the perpetrators were actually opponents of the government or whether it was a case of opportunity crime. Now, it was not simply a case of all commandeering being at the hands of the anti-treaty IRA. In many cases, the National Army also commandeered supplies, uh, but the payment for those was sent to the Army Finance Office. Now, among the claims, and again, this will be no surprise to you, there is clear evidence uh, that, in, that some instances of destruction and theft were due to local disputes, grievances, especially over land, or Republicans exacting a measure of revenge against their detractors and critics. One wonderful example of this uh, was a compensation claim in the name of Charles O'Sullivan, the Catholic Bishop of Kerry, and this involved two of his priests. Father Timothy Trant, PP of uh, Ballymacalligat, made a claim for £84 for the burning of a hay shed in Ballymacalligat. The shed was new because it replaced a predecessor which had been destroyed by the Black and Tans, so he knew exactly, down to the last rivet, what the shed had cost. Dr. Trant was con or Father Trant was co convinced that the hay shed was burned in protest at his strong denunciation of the burning of Ballycarty House, which was in his parish. Canon Michael Fuller sought £90 for the damage to the schoolhouse uh, at Rahavanig in Ballybunion between September 1922 and March 1923. So it's, it's a, a period of repeated damage uh, to this building and its contents. Now, according to the priest, this uh, behaviour uh, originated in a conspiracy, and he, that, that is his word, against him, to appoint a certain male teacher, which the canon was unwilling to do. Now, Trant received all but two pounds of the 84 that he was looking for, and Fuller received 50 pounds with costs. Now, these claims, they give us a tantalizing glimpse into simmering local tensions that had very little to do with the Anglo-Irish Treaty uh, or ideological uh, purity on the matter of the Republic. So just to bring matters to a conclusion, um, the cartoon on screen captures some of the fears at the time of a ballooning burden on the Irish taxpayer. In Kerry, those fears were not realised. With the removal of inadmissible claims, by mid-1924, the total value of claims that went to hearing uh, was just over £760,000. The total awarded, however, was just 10% of this amount, at £87,000. So at the Tralee court session, for example, 461000 uh, was claimed, but only 32500 was awarded. This led the Kerry Reporter newspaper to praise Liston on behalf of the ratepayers for opposing claims so successfully. Now that, however, is just one side of the story. The other, the economic trauma caused by the Civil War, was a legacy that has tended to be ignored uh, when we write about or think about the Civil War. Many precarious family incomes were decimated by the loss of a house or a livelihood or an animal. And this situation was exacerbated by a mounting cost of living crisis in the early years of the Free State. The Irish government's efforts at restitution only partially alleviated the economic trauma and hardship visited on the ordinary people of Kerry during the Civil War. For many of them, they did what they had done in previous decades. They struggled on. Shinawil Gormagal. Thank you very much, Tahi, and uh, I think that's a reminder that civil war is not only about the fatal casualties and the killing, but also about what an author we have today, here today, Gemma Clark, described as everyday violence.
However, our next speaker, Orson McMahon, is indeed going to talk about fatal violence. And Orson is a PhD candidate at Leiden University in the Netherlands, and he is, his interest is in civil war violence. He has chosen the unit of County Kerry to really look into the phenomenon of civil war violence in Ireland, and his talk is called Escalation, Targeted Killings and Outrage of Every Kind. So, Orson McMahon. Thank you for the introduction, John. Uh, I know time is, as always, a consideration, so I'll just briefly start off by thanking uh, Owen, Mary, Bridget, and everybody involved here just for giving me the opportunity to present here today. So what I'm going to look at is the character of the conflict as it was fought in Kerry, and how that compares to how it's been portrayed in the historiography. On one side is the idea that the conflict has been perhaps exaggerated or overstated. Uh, Tom Garvin, for example, called it half-hearted, rather like a large riot, while the violence in Kerry is often described as no more than exceptional incidents. On the other hand, John Regan has described the conflict as a war of annihilation, and Kerry civil war violence has also been described as more vicious, bitter, and protracted than anywhere else in Ireland. So how might we reconcile these seemingly conflicting viewpoints. The case for arguing that the conflict is overstated has been almost exclusively made using quantitative and comparative evidence. In the first instance, the relatively low death toll of the conflict is often cited. And while there's still no absolute clarity on the figure, reliable estimates range between 1,500 and 2,000 to 2,100 killed. We can see from the table here that even at its higher estimate, it was considerably less lethal than other well-known civil conflicts, both in aggregate and per capita numbers. If we look at the example most frequently cited in the literature, that of the Finnish Civil War in 1918, then we also see a significant lag with the Finnish conflict eight times more lethal per capita. If we look specifically at Kerry, we see the per capita figure is slightly higher than the national average, but perhaps still not what we might expect if the conflict really was significantly more brutal here than anywhere else. If we look at the next slide, we see the trajectory of violence in Kerry. From the data, we see the violence was sporadic, with almost every increase in activity followed by a decrease. Peter Hart argues that the direction of violence, rising or falling, is as important as absolute numbers of casualties. And the ebb and flow we see here suggests a sense of drift for most of the conflict. There's only one period which is highlighted in yellow that qualifies as escalatory. Um, by that we mean a period when the conflict's violence experienced a significant and sustained momentum change. And that was from January through March 1923 when the National Army intensified its killing. So again, these patterns don't suggest anything extraordinary with regard to the intensity or the velocity of the conflict's violence in Kerry. In addition to these points, there was an extremely low rate of attrition among civilians, it's been mentioned earlier, uh, during the conflict in Kerry, and there was no evidence of any systematic ethnic uh, or sectarian targeting of civilians by either side. Other anecdotal evidence from the period suggests that large swathes of daily life continued as normal. One contemporary newspaper report noted in October 1922, a month that saw 15 conflict-related uh, deaths in Kerry. Intralee, peace reigns, social life is again starting in the town, the golf links are becoming more frequented, and there are rumours of dances and the streets are full. So the comparatively low rate of lethality, the language trajectory of the conflict's uh, violence, the lack of violence directed against civilians, along with the impression that many aspects of daily life uh, continued on as normal, certainly challenges the idea that the civil war as fought in Kerry was more ruthless or brutal than elsewhere. So what evidence is there to support the idea that the conflict was more brutal in Kerry? Well, I would suggest that we might find the answer not in absolute terms, but in the character of the conflict, in the forms of violence that each side generated and the way that it was experienced by either side. I would argue that most of the violent killings in Kerry did not conform to what was considered acceptable violence. And using the results of a quantitative uh, analysis of conflict-related violent deaths, uh, I'll try to demonstrate some of the reasons that this might be true. So why use violent deaths as a metric? Well, violent deaths imply uh, a minimum threshold of violence, and they have similar results, obviously. 
making them reliable for comparison. Uh, I would also argue that they open unique window to the character of any conflict uh, from the perspective of those most intimately involved, the combatants. As Joanna Burke has argued, for politicians and historians, war may be about the conquest of territory or the struggle to recover a sense of national honour, but for the men on active service, it's simply concerned with the killing of other people. We can examine violent deaths to see to what degree they've violated contemporary moral codes. I would argue, for example, that both sides consider deaths incurred during what I would call traditional military activities, battles, roundups, as acceptable, especially if the person killed had a chance to defend uh, themselves or to surrender. How can we actually know what either side considered acceptable violence? I would argue that we know from how those who experienced it reacted to it. We know for, uh, I would argue that we know from how those who uh, experienced it reacted to it, sorry. The National Army, uh, the government, opposition parties, press, they were unified in their condemnation of IRA tactics such as ambushing or the killing of soldiers performing uh, non-military duties, with Richard Mulcahy directly referring to these types of killings when he stated in the dial, the irregulars in Kerry have stooped to outrage of every kind. The IRA, for its part, condemned executions, official and unofficial, with Todd Andrews uh, later writing that the net effect of the executions policy in this case was merely to intensify my hatred of the enemy. Even 10 years after the conflict uh, ended, it was possible to still detect residual bitterness in many military service pension applications for IRA men killed in Kerry, as we can see here from this example. When asked to provide details of particular killings, referees often made comments uh, such as this one which reads, nobody but the murder gang would have personal knowledge. So what we see then is a definite sense in how both sides reacted that certain forms of violence violated commonly understood uh, boundaries, expectations and standards. So I'll first look at the violence that the National Army generated during the Civil War in Kerry. There were at least 172 verifiable violent conflict-related deaths. The National Army were responsible for the deaths of 72 IRA men, with just over a quarter of these occurring during what I've just described as traditional military activities. A further seven came in the form of official executions. Now, these occurred on just two occasions and carried the first almost six months into the conflict and the second just a few weeks before its end. Uh, and while these killings certainly caused deep resentment, the timing of them suggests that they had a, a limited influence on the character of the conflict in Kerry. Of more interest is the remaining 39 or 54 percent of the total of IRA men who were killed uh, as a result of extra legal killings. I would argue that the violence that the National Army inflicted upon this group has been most influential in shaping the historiography of the conflict in Kerry. 17 from this group died in landmine explosions in March 1923. Now, as these incidents are already quite well known, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Suffice to say that they are cited extensively in the historiography as evidence of reprisals and what one historian has described as the indiscipline and incompetence of the National Army in Kerry. While the National Army claimed that the men were picked at random, analysis of the victims' backgrounds shows that they were in fact closely connected and I would argue that their deaths exhibit many of the hallmarks of what Kyle Grayson defines as targeted killings, the premeditated selection and elimination of named individuals. If we look at the table, uh, we see some of the striking similarities in the demographic and social profiles of the men. They were all experienced physical force nationalists with the Military Service Registration Board awarding an average of more than four and a half years service each. Patrick Hartnett, who was just 24 years old, had already more than seven years service. Over three quarters of the group were the sons of farmers, more than 10 times the county average of just over 7%, with half of them eldest sons and many working the family farm. This occupation afforded the group flexibility and discretion, with one IRA commander later remarking, only for being farmer sons, they could not have done the job at all. Where it could be determined, they were also, almost without exception, members of their respective battalion or brigade active service units. If the social characteristics of the men suggest a particular cohort, then an examination of the communities they came from uh, confirms this. <clears throat> 
The case of George O'Shea killed at Ballycedi is informative, but in no way unique amongst this group. O'Shea lived at house number one in Fahavan, a small rural village of just seven houses northeast of Tralee. He was Kilflynn Company Captain and a member of the Kerry Number no. One Brigade Active Service Unit. O'Shea's younger brother Daniel served as the company adjutant, while next door uh, neighbour John Shanahan was quartermaster. At house number five lived Stephen Fuller, the only survivor at Ballycedi, who was first lieutenant, while Timothy Toomey, who would also die at Ballycedi, uh, lived in a neighbouring townland and served in the same company. As well as being comrades, most of the victims were friends and neighbours, having grown up together in small, tight-knit rural communities. Further an analysis also reveals that the men were mostly drawn from a select group of the most resolute and active units in the county, the Kerry No. 1, 3rd and 7th Battalions, and the Kerry No. 2, 4th Battalion, areas which contain notorious ambush sites such as Brennan's Glen, Hedford, and Baraduff. The OC of Kerry No. 2 Brigade, John Joe Rice, uh, remarked admiringly after the war, there were wild garsoons around Hedford. And when Humphrey Murphy, the OC of Kerry No. 1 Brigade, called a meeting in November 1922 to discuss the deteriorating situation for the IRA in North Kerry, only two people had turned up, George O'Shea and Patrick Hartnett. We can see then that these men fit a very narrow and particular profile, with the Army later describing them as some of the most inveterate and irreconcilable opponents of the government. Grayson describes the function of targeted killings as a tactic that seeks to shape social orders as part of wider pacification programs. And in the weeks that followed, the IRA's offensive activities in Kerry virtually ceased, with National Army reports triumphantly noting that the morale of the regulars is sinking to a low level as a direct result of the killings. IRA officer John Canam would later confirm this, alleging it was done pure and simple to stop our activities. Alongside these high-profile killings, the historiography also alludes to a low-level yet persistent campaign of extra-legal killings by the National Army that spanned the conflict. The evidence confirms this with the remaining 22 extra-legal killings uh, occurring between the 21st of September 1922 and the 13th of April 1923. Of this group, about 60% died during what we might call hot-blooded killings, committed spontaneously and with little evidence of planning or organisation. IRA Captain Frank Grady, for example, was part of a large group of suspected IRA men rounded up at Glen Bay in 1923. He became involved in a verbal altercation with a National Army officer who promptly drew his pistol and shot him twice in the head at Point Blank Range. To add to the sense of, of volatility and unpredictability, National Army soldiers were often intoxicated during these encounters. William Harrington was shot dead during a raid in Tralee in December 1922, with the coroner's inquest finding that he was killed deliberately and without justification by a National Army officer who admitted being under the influence of alcohol. Despite there being many witnesses, none of these instances or many others like them resulted in disciplinary action being taken against National Army soldiers. The remaining 40% of this group were killed in what we might call cold-blooded extra-legal killings, which occurred after the victims had been in custody a significant amount of time, exhibiting greater elements of organisation and premeditation. Cases like Daniel Robert McCarthy arrested near Dingle in March 1923, beaten and tortured for three days before being shot dead, illustrated the often protracted and deliberate nature of these killings. The landmine killings of March 1923 are often referred to as exceptional incidents, but even if we exclude them, the National Army still killed more IRA men through extra-legal killings than it did during traditional military activities in Kerry. This analysis confirms that the majority of the violence that the National Army generated in Kerry was arbitrary, callous, and outside the contemporary scope of what was considered acceptable violence. Next, I'll look at the violence that the anti-treaty IRA generated during the conflict, which I would argue on the whole has been treated somewhat more sympathetically and often focuses on economic aspects, such as their destruction of property and transport infrastructure in Kerry. Of the 70 National Army soldiers killed by the IRA in Kerry during the Civil War, over half were killed during ambushes, instances in which troops were surprised by attackers from concealed positions with no warning and no opportunity to defend themselves or to surrender. IRA ambushes like the one on the military convoy near Killarney in September 1922 give us an idea of the levels of violence employed. A contemporary newspaper reported the attackers swept the lorries with heavy fire from machine guns and rifles at close range. 
uh, from both sides of the road and without any warning as the convoy passed through, resulting in the deaths of two soldiers and seven wounded. It wasn't unusual for the National Army to be ambushed repeatedly like this while moving around, with one patrol from Castlemaine to Tralee, a distance of around 16 kilometres, ambushed at five different points, again with a number of soldiers killed and wounded. The IRA also ambushed and killed National Army soldiers while they fulfilled secondary duties, for example, escorting food go uh, convoys or providing security for banks or courthouses, tasks which it was felt may have exempted them from attack. The most controversial killing of soldiers performing secondary duties was probably the killing of Red Cross men, the target of which was such a constant feature of the conflict in Kerry that one contemporary newspaper dubbed it the Republican hobby in Kerry. In total, 14 soldiers, or almost one in every five of the total number killed by the IRA during the conflict, were killed while performing secondary duties. The next category we'll look at were those National Army soldiers who were killed whilst off duty, men who were unarmed and posed little immediate physical threat to the IRA. Killings like those of Cecil Fitzgerald uh, and Joseph O'Mara, already mentioned earlier, in Killarney in August 1922, who were ambushed and shot while visiting a religious site on a day off. These were the first of six such killings of off-duty soldiers that would occur in the county. And these types of killings were especially contentious, even within the IRA itself, with Liam Lynch ordering a halt to such killings as early as September 1922, recognising the damaging effect that they had on the IRA's public image. The IRA was also prepared to use barbaric and inhumane weapons. The killing of five National Army soldiers at Knockmagoshal in March 1923 with a, man, uh, with a landmine caused controversy and reaction. But it's important to note that just as many soldiers died in Kerry after being shot with expanding bullets, uh, the use of which was widely condemned at the time. Soldiers like Private James Byrne killed in an ambush near Liz Dahl in October 1922, with reports noting that his corpse was practically beyond recognition, his face was swollen twice its ordinary size, and was quite black. In total, some 57% of the National Army soldiers killed by the IRA in Kerry died in such controversial circumstances. These killings often precipitated reprisals, but analysis showing that over half of the subsequent extra-legal killings that the National Army committed were direct responses to killings such as these. Also of interest is the chronology of the IRA's violence. If we take the first confirmed extra-legal killing by the National Army in Kerry as a starting point on the 27th of September 1922, uh, we can see it on the graph, that the IRA had already killed 16 National Army soldiers in controversial circumstances, just under 40% of what would be the final total of those killed in this manner. So the implementation of these uh, tactics was not any act of desperation uh, nor a reaction to a declining military outlook or a response to any national army escalation. If we look at the chart again, then we see that the early months of the conflict through to December 1922, the time when the IRA were at their strongest in Kerry was also the time when they were at their most ruthless. So what can we conclude from all this? Well, the purpose of this paper has been to try to see the degree to which the violence which constituted the civil war in Kerry conforms to descriptions which posit it as more brutal, vicious, and protracted than anywhere else in Ireland. What we have seen is that the violence which both sides perpetrated was modest in comparison with other civil conflicts and with little in the way of sustained escalatory patterns. However, much of it did still violate contemporary moral codes around what was considered acceptable violence. The National Army engaged in targeted killings, impromptu killings, premeditating killings, with the majority of the death that it was responsible for, extra-legal killings. It was also the only side which demonstrated an ability to escalate its violence. In its defence, the evidence shows around half of extra-legal killings were direct responses to IRA violence, demonstrating a reactive nature to their actions. This notwithstanding, William Hart Holden argues that state terrorism is one of the most nefarious kinds of terrorism, frequently involving the use of extra-legal killings. And if this is so, then the National Army's campaign in Kerry was largely one of terror. For its part, the IRA was not reluctant to employ controversial means to kill either. While the evidence demonstrated an inability, to escalate its violent killings, they still killed almost 57% of National Army soldiers in controversial circumstances, representing an almost identical balance of abuses with the 54% of IRA victims of extra-legal killings. <laughs> 
It has also been demonstrated that the IRA were the initial drivers of controversial killings in the county and had committed a significant number before even the first extra-legal killing by the National Army. I would therefore argue that the civil war in Kerry was indeed brutal, vicious and protracted. However, the evidence as presented does not demonstrate conclusively whether it was more brutal and vicious than anywhere else in Ireland, a question that I'm attempting to address in my current PhD research, which will compare the conflict's violence across a number of counties. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Orson, for a very illuminating talk there. I think it, it shows us, you know, the different perceptions of guerrilla warfare and what one side considers acceptable military tactics is a crime to the other side. Now, moving on, our last speaker of this panel is Richard McGalliot. So, like Dahi, but unlike myself and Orson, he's a native of the kingdom. He is originally from Kilflin County, Kerry, and his talk will be about a local theme. But he teaches history in... Dundalk IT. Uh, he's written about sports history, so Forging a Kingdom, the GAA in Kerry, 1884 to 1934, and he's contributed various chapters on the same thing. However, today, for our Civil War theme, the title of his talk is The Last Cry of Aero Lions Echoed in the Years of Kerry Man, in the Ears of Kerry Man for Long After. So this is about the Clashmeakin Cave incident right at the end of the Civil War. So a local story about the last major encounter in Kerry in the Civil War. So please welcome Richard McElligot. Uh, thanks, John, um, and thanks to all the organisers. Great to be here today. It's a bit more about Kilflin in general than just um, that. But Kilflin, if you don't know, uh, it's about seven miles out that way on the Listore Road. So if you're driving along the N69, you'll see the signpost for the turnoff to the left. And from the road, you'll see the village rising up from the shallow plain of the Chanel River. Now, I believe we're all products of where we come from, and the places we're born and raised in leave these indelible marks on us. And I've no doubt that my love of history, and in particular my fascination with the Irish Revolutionary Era, is down to being from Kilflin, because my small village's history is interwoven with the bitter legacy of civil war. And growing up, you could still sense its nebulous shadow clinging to my locality. This history was, from a young age, very tangible to me. And that's why when I first began teaching about this era at third level institutions like UCD and later DKIT, I was a little bit shocked by how little students seem to know or understand about the Irish Civil War. There is perhaps an understandable detachment to the Civil War in places like Dublin or Loud that just doesn't exist somewhere like North Kerry, even a century on. So what I'd like to do today is discuss the Civil War's impact on this community of around 124 people, as it was in 1923. Now, the great historian of civil wars, Status Calivas, reminds us that such conflicts are often the cruelest because, at a micro level, the violence engendered often results from local factors that drive the struggle's dynamics. I therefore believe Kilflin's experience can, in many ways, be seen as a microcosm of the complex effect and legacy the Civil War, had, uh, Civil War had and left on Irish society as a whole. Now, to help illustrate all that, uh, I'd like to focus on the lives of five young Kilflynn men and their families and how they were marked by the last desperate weeks of the war in Kerry. Those five men are Stephen Fuller, uh, Timothy Aero Lines, George O'Shea, Timothy Toomey, and John Shannon. Now, in 1923, all were aged between 21 and 27. Most of them were close neighbours. They were farmers' sons. They were also very well known in the community and had served with the IRA for several years at this point. Indeed, from a young age, O'Shea and Lyons were recognised locally as leaders. In 1916, O'Shea founded and captained the Tullig Gamecocks, who won Kilflynn that year's Kerry Hurling County Hurling Championship. A year later, O'Shea was elected captain of the newly formed Kilflynn Company of the Irish Volunteers. His teammate Fuller, along with Lyons, Toomey and Shanahan, enlisted with him. Now, one of his superiors described O'Shea as, quote, a splendid type of man and a credit to the national movement. Lyons, meanwhile, was recalled as, by those who knew him as someone who was uncommonly brave, lean, hardy, and being an expert marksman. And of course, his evocative epithet, Aero, was derived from the reputation he earned during the War of Independence of suddenly arriving at an engagement as if from thin air. 
Now, in that conflict, the Kilfen Company fought with some distinction. Nevertheless, the treaty's terms proved as divisive within the Kilflin IRA as anywhere else. For example, Stephen Fuller recalled, and I quote, nearly all went free state when a vote on the terms of the treaty was put to the hundred odd men of the company. Only 34 supported O'Shea's rejection. Yet, the long history of civil wars globally constantly illustrates that in any place, the commitment of a minority is often enough. Kelly Bass observed that civil wars by their nature involve only small sections of any community. Now, following the National Army's sea landings in August 1922 and their takeover of the major urban centres across Kerry, O'Shea's company was engaged in the increasingly desperate guerrilla war that played out across the country, a county against that enemy against the enemy, I should say. But of course, that perceived enemy was also on their doorstep. A fascinating illustration of this, uh, and a fascinating illustration of how the conflict was fracturing communities like Kilflin came actually on the 4th of September, when the national press reported on a proclamation found posted up around the village. You can see it here on the slide. Signed by O'Shea, styling himself as the competent military authority, it declared that, quote, drastic action would be taken against the local priest, Father O'Sullivan, and any persons, and I quote, who assist in establishing British authority under the guise of free state in Ireland. Now, Father O'Sullivan was accused of, quote, overstepping his sacred office by using the altar to make, and I quote again, incendiary statements calculated to cause serious disaffection among the loyal supporters of the Irish Republic. Now, I think such activity is a stark demonstration of what Dr. Gemma Clark found was the common tactic of non-lethal social violence used to intimidate and impose control at a local level on, in the Irish Civil War. But of course, as the winter of 1922 approached, the increasing tempo of army sweeps and roundups in North Kerry reduces O'Shea's unit to an existence of evasion. Then in early February 1923, the army begins to conduct a fresh series of raids in the Kilflin area. And the frequency of these operations suggests they knew they were closing the net on O'Shea's men. Finally, as you can see reported there on the 23rd of February, the army's Kerry command issued a communique reporting that reporting on the capture of O'Shea, Fuller, Shanahan and Toomey after their dugout was discovered. Now this was remembered locally as being a fairly sophisticated shelter in Glen Ballyma Wood, a couple of miles east of the village. It was constructed under a ditch at a quarry next to the wood and was large enough to comfortably accommodate four men. Now, local memory is also that the hideout was protected by this kind of improvised early warning system, consisting of a series of tin cans and strings which were attached to the trees running from the encampment to a lookout position at the edge of the wood. I suppose the idea was that if an enemy patrol was spotted nearby, a lookout could start tapping on the cans to alert his comrades. However, on the day in question, no such signal was heard by those in the dugout, and they were surrounded before they knew it. They were brought to Tralee, Tralee's Ballymun Barracks, uh, and the four men were then put under interrogation by Colonel David Nelligan, who had effectively been handpicked by Michael Collins to oversee the Army's intelligence network in Kerry. Now, for most of them, this interrogation amounted to being blindfolded and having their arms tied to their side as their heads, body, and limbs were smashed with hammers. One eyewitness remembered some of the prisoners being thrown back into their cells, so spattered in their own blood that their shirts were clinging to their backs. Now, although Fuller was spared such torture by the intervention of one local army officer who po protested, and I quote, that I was a good fella in the Tan War time, he and others, of course, were also put through the terrifying ordeal of a mock execution by firing squad, again in an effort to make them talk and give up their friends and comrades. Later, they were brought before a military tribunal. They were then taken away to the nearby workhouse, uh, and they were imprisoned in a room which was partially flooded, forcing them to keep standing. Finally, of course, in the early hours of the 7th of March, Fuller, O'Shea and Toomey were among the nine prisoners brought upstairs and informed that, as Fuller later testified, and I quote, we were to be blown to atoms as a reprisal for the deaths of the Free State officers killed in Ochnagoshal. Now, Shanahan was left behind. As his spine had been so badly beaten, he was temporarily paralysed. As we know, Fuller, in his own words, escaped death by a miracle at the mine explosion at Bally CD a couple of hours later. Yet his friends, O'Shea and Toomey, were now nothing but pieces of flesh festooning branches and pulverized bodies that were being shoveled back into coffins, coffins by their fellow countrymen. And of course it was said the soldiers were, had to be provided with drinks to fortify their nerves for that gruesome task. 
Ballycidi then was a classic example of gratuitous violence utilised to send a warning to the wider community. The noted psychologist of killing, Dave Grossman, would argue such events are intended quite simply to scare the hell out of people and undermine their will to resist. Now, Fuller suffered, of course, severe injuries. He recalled the skin being burnt off, all the skin being burnt off his hands and the back of his legs and, and back itself. Uh, yet he regained enough composure after being blown clear of the bast to escape undetected in the pre-dawn darkness, eventually reaching the safety of a local house. Afterwards, hiding in a series of Republican safe houses, Fuller supplied one of the local senior IRA commanders, John Joe Sheehy, with a brief testimony, and she helped release it to the anti-treaty press, ex beginning to expose the truth about Ballycidi. Already, of course, graffiti and posters were being plastered onto walls around Tralee, declaring, and I quote, Kerry will not forget, and don't join Daly's murdering. Now, as you can see on the slide, Fuller's statement was then carried by the anti-treaty mouthpiece to Daily Bulletin on the 22nd of March. This forced the issue to be raised in the Dáil. It compelled Richard Mulcahy to order General Paddy O'Daly to hold his effectively whitewash of an inquiry into the killings of Ballycidi, Countess Bridge and Cahar Sivine. By now, however, Fuller's mental and physical state was displaying the unmistakable effects of severe trauma. Mary Daly recalls him slipping into a terrible temporary coma as he took refuge with her family, and for the next 15 months he was unable to sleep owing to the post-traumatic stress he suffered. Fuller would spend the, most of the next year in hiding, making only one brief trip home to Kilflin to see his family as soon as he felt able, as he quotes, just to let them know I was okay. Meanwhile, a week after Ballycidi, the Cork Examiner carried a brief report of the burial of O'Shea and Toomey in front of a large congregation in Kilflin. Now, soon after that, Jeremiah Toomey, who was Timothy's father, wrote to the government's Compensational Personal Injuries Committee requesting recompense over the nature of his killing. But as you can see here on the slide, as part of the intricate cover-up surrounding these killings, files that were kept secret until 2008 highlight how, in July 1924, the Secretary of the Compensation Committee assured the Department of Justice that they would, and I quote, be very careful to guard against making any recommendation for payment of compensation in these specific cases. Now, on the ground, the brutal killing of the 17 Republican prisoners and the Kerry landmine explosions seemed to serve their purpose. A week after Ballycidi, an army report noted that areas like North Kerry were now, quote, practically dead letters as far as irregular operations were concerned. The only exception to that would come in mid-April when Aero Lyons met his death. Now, Lyons had actually escaped the February roundup in Kilflin due to being given, due to be given because he was given command of another IRA column operating around Artfurt in January. And by now, this unit remained the only one active in North Kerry. On the 16th of April, Lyons and six of his comrades were tracked and laid siege to at a remote hideout in Clashmelkin Caves. Now, I know Dr. Fanula Walsh's paper tomorrow will go into in more detail uh, the events which followed. Suffice it to say for now that after two days holed up in the caves and having lost two of his men to drowning, Lyons on the morning of the 18th of April appeared at the mouth of the cave to try and make terms to spare the lives of others. A rope was lowered to pull Lyons up, but as he neared the cliff top, it suddenly snapped. His body then crashed onto the sea rocks below and was then, and I quote, riddled by machine gun fire, according to his sister Julia. Now, as you can see there on the screen, on the 21st of April, the Freeman's Journal described how Lyons' mother, sitting in her home outside Kilflane, was said to have instantly known of his death when the large pendulum on the clock, uh, the large pendulum clock on the wall, which had actually not functioned for 15 years, suddenly struck midday. Now, contemporary IRA accounts support the commonly held belief locally that the rope hoisting lines had been deliberately cut. Interestingly, an eyewitness account of the siege in the Army's newspaper on Tuglock simply described Lyons as being shot while he tried to run from the cave. Lyons' body was swept out to sea, but it was recovered two weeks later. His remains were then buried next to O'Shea's and Toomey's, and then in July 1925, a large stone memorial cross was unveiled over their burial plot in Kilflin Cemetery. In front, and this ceremony went in ahead in front of a large crowd of locals who were nervously monitored by a sizable detachment of Gardaí and armed military. Now, in Kilflin, Lyons' death would remain an emotive touchstone. And I suppose maybe given the barbaric nature of Ballycidi, it was perhaps understandable Lyons' end was maybe recast as this kind of epic tragedy, frequently recalled in newspapers and at commemorative events in the decades that followed. 
On the 50th anniversary, the Irish press, reflecting on his callous debt and the, quote, long scream he gave as he fell, evocatively declared that the last cry of Aero Lyons was to echo in the ears of Kerrymen for long years after. Now, it's a truism that even in areas like Kerry, Ireland's civil war never reached the carnage of similar conflicts across contemporary Europe. Yet the resonance the civil war retains in Irish life is not reflective of any body count it is that was produced. It's rawder because of the nature of these killings. Anne Dolan has recently cautioned against imposing what she called a hierarchy of killing to downplay the civil war's impact here when crudely matched to bloodier struggles abroad. And that I would argue the deaths of O'Shea, Toomey and Lyons would have left a void every bit as bad every bit as bitter in a small village like Kilflin than thousands of dead would in another country. Likewise, the physical ending of the Civil War could not hope to dissipate the communal anger and resentment the conflict gener generated there. For example, in April 1924, a local was grievously assaulted by a gang of six in, the pub, in a local pub in Kilflin. Those men entered the premises with a member of the Gardee who had availed of a lift in their lorry. On seeing his uniform, the local called him, and I quote, nothing but a black and tan. He was immediately attacked by the gang, some of whom were former National Army soldiers. And of course, for years, after, some locals who had backed the Free State were determined to abuse the latitude this now seemingly afforded them. Many of my grandfather's neighbours, particularly women associated with the IRA men killed or imprisoned for their activity, were threatened and intimidated. Often these perpetrators came at night to reinforce their victims' sense of helplessness. Now, around the end of 1923, Fuller finally judged it safe enough to return home to Kilflin for good, but it's clear he remained in fear of his life. And one striking illustration of this comes in August of 1925, when Fuller's younger brother, Sean, appeared at Tralee District Court, charged with the possession of two concealed rifles found during a police search of the family home. During the court hearing, Sergeant Kerwin confirmed his men had initially come to the house inquiring after Stephen Fuller before then searching the premises. Now, latching onto this, the accused solicitor pointed to Stephen Fuller in the crowd and protested to the court that, quote, he's constantly under the impression that something else is going to be done to him. This man has gone through enough already. He doesn't want people to be asking after him. And very tellingly, despite the seriousness of the charge, the presiding, the presiding judge agreed to be lenient, and Sean was fined just two pounds. One can't help but think the judge felt that maybe the Fullers had suffered enough at the hands of the authorities at this stage. Of course, the physical and mental effects of Ballycidi remained with him all his life. Though Fuller would make a sufficient physical recovery to captain the Kilflin Hurlers to the North League, Kerry League title of 1926, Seven. By the early 1930s, his health had once again begun to decline. He was diagnosed as suffering from neurasthenia, a contemporary term for PTSD, while a host of foreign bodies remained embedded in the musculature of his back and legs due to the explosion. He was eventually awarded in 1933 a wounded pension of over 52 pounds a year. Now, he was a hugely popular and respected figure in our community, and Fuller entered local politics after joining Fianna Fáil. And in 1937, he successfully stood for election as a TD, serving in the Dáil until 1943. And though he made brief references to his IRA record on that campaign trail, he never referred to the Civil War or Ballycidi. Those rare conversations were instead reserved for the company of his former comrades, and on occasion, his family. Just last month, in a very poignant interview given to the Irish Times, his son Pawdy remembers once asking his father if he was ever tempted to exact revenge on people like Paddy O'Daly. Fuller replied, and I quote, I thought about it a lot, and I was going to do it, but I thought it better to let him live with it. It affected those fellows as well, like. Such magnanimity, of course, was in stark contrast to the pettiness of local Kerry politics in this era. Incredibly, Fuller was not invited to the unveiling of the Ballycidi Monument in 1959, as it was an event organised by Sinn Féin. When finally approached to film an interview about Ballycidi for the BBC's Ireland of Television History, Fuller expressed his surprise that, quote, I had not been interviewed before. I suppose it was because it was a job done by Irishmen. Aged 84, Fuller died in February 1984, and as you can see on screen, his death was met with glowing local and national tributes. All the while, of course, trauma and torment would envelop the lives of the distraught families of O'Shea, Toomey and Lyons. And they further faced years of bureaucratic barriers to get some small compensation for their incalculable personal loss. The photos of Lyons and Toomey 
were eventually awarded a gratuity of £112 as compensation for their debts, the sum reflecting the military pension board's stringent view that both men had only been partially dependent on their sons. Now, the resentment that drips through these application pen for, uh, for pensions was reflected in the account of the men's service records given by their brigade commander, Humphrey Murphy. When requested, as you can see here, to give particulars of Toomey and O'Shea's debt, he pointedly wrote, Ask Davy Nelligan and Paddy Daly. Now, unlike his friends, George O'Shea was the made breadwinner for his family, having worked maintaining roads for Kerry County Council. And the impact of his sudden death, in an emotional and material sense, is painfully felt in the pension applications submitted by his widowed mother and siblings. His sister Molly was only 21 when George died. A local member of Come and the Man, she acted as a scout, cook and messenger for her brother's unit. However, the cruel killing of her adoring brother and then that of her close friend Lyons so soon afterwards caused Molly to have a complete mental breakdown. She would spend years in a local psychiatric hospital before the authorities finally classified her as, quote, a harmless lunatic and hopelessly insane. They allowed her brother Dan to take her back home to kill Flynn to care for her. Molly died in 1948, aged just 39. And she was just one tread of the traumatic tapestry the Civil War wove in places like Kill Flynn. And to finish up, while the dead might finally lie in peace, there were some locally who would not extend the same courtesy to the living. In the years which followed, suspicion would shadow John Shannon. Some whispered about the reasons why he was not selected for Ballycidi, when another man, John Daly, was similarly paralyzed, but still brought out there on a stretcher. And despite several accounts attesting to the injuries Shanahan suffered at the hands of his captors, for decades to come, some remained convinced it had all been an act. The fact he emigrated to the US so soon after the Civil War was all the proof some needed of his supposed guilt. He returned home a few years later. But even into the 70s, my father vividly recalls those locals who remained susceptible to these, this kind of groundless hearsay, who would turn back if they, if they came upon this now old man on the road, who would quickly drink up and leave by another door if he entered the local pub, who would look on with accusing eyes and held tongues. Now, Dr. Schieffer Aikens, Recent work has helped to nuance the wall of silence that supposedly descended at the end of the Civil War. But I would argue a yet understudied legacy of this conflict is the communal breakdowns and mistrusts that played out for decades to come all across Ireland in communities like Kilflynn. Though often unspoken, they illustrate the same sort of enduring trauma that lingered in areas like Kilflynn, one that could never be healed, at least not until the last of this generation went to their graves. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Richard, and I think that was a very visceral and emotive look at the impact of the Civil War locally in a place like Kilflynn. And I think you'll agree with me also that we had three very good papers here that really explored, you know, in detail, you know, the Civil War in County Kerry. Now, we have about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, I'm going to request a microphone be brought up uh, for our speakers. Oh, we have it there, okay. So, uh, I'll ask you to raise your hands if you have a question. And two little provisos, I'm sure you'll, you'll all be fine with, is... First of all, wait for the microphone, and secondly, please ask your question as a question. Okay, hands up, please. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. A fantastic panel. I've got loads of questions, but I'll just ask one. Um, so for Orson, I was really interested in, in um, kind of how, how the violence is, uh, the different ways it's represented, so this idea of... Um, maybe some of the state violence, oh, it's exceptional, it's just a few bad guys doing these bad things. Is that, uh, versus maybe anti-treaty, tr being tr treated more fav favorably, is this something you're seeing in the historiography and or something at the time? Because I'm thinking, you know, off, we still get this today with state violence, you know, think about the, poli you know, the police in the UK, like it's just a few bad guys, like, so uh, is it uh, like this kind of exceptionalism? Is this something where maybe parallels being drawn at the time with kind of the you know, the, the black and tans and all that sort of stuff, because it, it, seem, it seems a lot to sort of mirror that narrative, really, of, um, you know, okay. just these, drunk, these drunken blokes. It's not systemic. It's not colonial or whatever it might be. Thanks. Yes, uh, I think in Kerry, I think you've got two elements at play. Uh, I think earlier there was a... Uh, 
there was somebody made the point of uh, General, General W. R. E. Murphy. Uh, I think it was John actually, uh, and he quoted him as saying that he needed some Oriel House men sent down. Uh, you and know Halpin, I think, has has done some work on that, and I think a quote that sticks out to me when he talks about Oriel House men, he says they were doers, not talkers, specialists in clandestine assassination. And I think you had an element, uh, whether they would strictly be classed as National Army or whether they would be intelligence operatives that worked in Kerry and the same names crop up uh, with, mo uh, with most of what I would class as the, the more focused, targeted killings. Uh, Gaffney, uh, Ned Breslin, uh, Culhane, and they're the same people that are at uh, either directly orchestrating the murders or they're present at the murders when people are arrested and taken away. So I think there is an element that there's a, there's a hard core of intelligence operatives working there that are targeting people specifically. Uh, I also think that there is an element of what I called in my paper uh, impromptu killings, where National Army officers were, were challenged verbally or physically by, by people they were arresting, that situations got out of hand, uh, that people were intoxicated, and they escalated in that moment to a killing. So I do think you have, you've got a hardcore uh, of, of, I would call them intelligence officers uh, operating in Kerry, and they're targeting very particular people uh, uh, one uh, very good example, and it, it, it isn't, uh, hasn't been mentioned, I uh, don't think. Um, I think his name was Daniel Murphy. Uh, he was killed at Nochnagoshal in April 1923. He was a blacksmith, uh, and he had been involved in the mining of Fiennet Pier. Uh, and there was, in his military service pension file, uh, his mother and, I think, relatives denied that he was the one responsible for uh, constructing the mine that was used at Nantagoshal, but he was abducted from his home, uh, again by Lieutenant Gaffney and Commandant Culhane, and they brought him to Nantagoshal uh, and they shot him dead. But I think you also get a sense uh, there were people killed with a single gunshot wound. Uh, this blacksmith, Daniel Murphy, uh, I think there, there was a poem wrote about him within his uh, military service uh, pension file, and I think he was shot 11 or 12 times. So it's not just the violence, it's the levels of extreme violence that are used in some of the killings, and it's, they serve a, a secondary function, obviously, to, to, to give a message. So to answer your question uh, in the short term, I think there are two elements at play. I think there's, there's more disorganized, random violence goes on, but I think there is a hardcore of intelligence officers that are, that are working there. I won't say in the background, because their names are mentioned in almost every file. They're the people who arrest. Uh, and I think you have those two elements at play in Kerry. Okay, Richard uh, Dahi, do you want to get in there at all? No, uh, Richard, yeah. No, I think he's... No, good, okay, good. next question then. Uh, yeah, go ahead. This one here, please. Hello, for, for uh, excellent presentations all morning. Uh, Rory Fing from Youth University. Just my question is, 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 in relation to the targeted killings, operationally, <laughs> did the targeted killing policy work to bring an end to the conflict in Kerry? I know it's a very uh, visceral... Uh, Area, and I'm not asking the question from a moral or a normative point of view, but from the anti treaty, aka regulars, uh, I IRA, did the targeted killing policy prevent them from carrying a backlash against uh, the Free State National Army? And ultimately, did it deter uh, the anti treaty IRA to dumping arms in, in 1923 and also preventing new recruits joining the, the anti treaty forces? Uh, I'll take that for a second and hand it over. Um, it's, that's a, it's a difficult question because if you're talking about the epicenter of the reprisals is at a time when the, the conflict is petering out, but there are still those elements uh, in areas like North Kerry, South Kerry holding out. You know, I mentioned Air Alliance and so on. I mean, I mentioned uh, Dave Grossman and his, his assessment of, of exemplary violence. And I think Bally Seedy, is a classic example of that. And remember, remember what happened after Bally C immediately after Bally City. The bodies which were 
you know, unrecognizable pieces of flesh, you know, uh, shoveled in indiscriminately, like Stephen Fuller's coffin was full of remains. That's why they, they thought he was dead as well. Brought back uh, to Ballymun Barracks in Tralee. There's already rumors going around that there's an explosion. People see the, see the coffins coming in. Around 4 p.m. that afternoon, the crowd comes, including the relatives, to hand, to hand to, for, those, for those bodies to be handed back. As that's being done, and they're opening, and they see the horrifying nature of those remains, the, brass, the army brass band play, starts playing jazz music, up-tempo jazz music. Like, what is that only sadistic viciousness to, again, reinforce a point? Don't mess with us. You know, you, you, kill a, you, kill a, you keep killing us, and this is what's going to happen to you and your families and so on. Um, and, like, when you look after what happens at Ballycidi, uh, Countess Bridge, um, outside Car Savine, like I'm sure Orson will say the same, you look at the army command, the weekly army command reports afterwards, and they say like the, the violence has stopped. North Kerry, as I said, becomes a dead letter. Uh, there is a huge, um, there is a huge drop off to the extent that that's why Clash Milken Cave is seen as the last act because it is the last major, I suppose, engagement, for want of a better word. So I think in that sense, in that short time period, I think it did definitely work. You know, it scared the hell out of people. Like and. There was other, I know in Kilflynn, there was other men still at large immediately after, about a week after they come in voluntarily. Even though they weren't active, they were still, you know, they still identified themselves as the anti-treaty IRA. And it's, it's reported in the press, they come in, put up their hands and say, you know, it's, it's, it's maybe being incarcerated now <laughs> and maybe hopefully being sent out of Kerry is your best chance of surviving. Orson? Uh, to answer your question, as obviously as, as best I can, uh, I think the National Army felt that the targeted killings did its job. Uh, I think I used a couple of quotes there. Uh, there were National Army uh, weekly reports. They're in the Civil War Ops files in the, in the military archive. And you get a sense from reading them. Um, the, the, they, they speak about the, the level of morale amongst uh, the anti-treaty, the irregulars as they call them, has sunk to a low level uh, as a direct result of the killings. Uh, they talk about how uh, the prisoners uh, who are interned at that time, how more and more of them are now signing the, the, the uh, undertaking uh, not to, to, to become involved in activity anymore. Um, from my own research, uh, violent incidents in the maybe four to six weeks after that, that the conflict continued, stayed at a similar type of level, but they, instead of being direct attacks on soldiers, it, it, what you saw more was long-range sniping of barracks as things that were easy to do and had a very low level of risk. Uh, uh, one last thing that I would uh, say about it is, after those killings in March, I'm pretty sure only three more National Army soldiers were killed. Two of them, uh, as, as Richard would know, were at Clash Caves, and the last one probably, um, maybe goes back to what uh, the question Gemma asked. There was a, a National Army soldier killed in April 1923. I think his name was Michael Bain. Uh, he was ambushed along with another National Army soldier. They had been called to mediate a land dispute. And when they were returning, they were ambushed. Uh, and if you read between the lines, it seems as though they were called out to be in a certain place at a certain time. and. Uh, <coughs> They were ambushed and uh, fired upon with machine guns, and Michael Beam was killed, but the one who escaped was um, uh, uh, Lieutenant Gaffney, and he was the soldier who was executed in 1924, uh, having been con c convicted of murdering, again, another uh, civilian, I think it was around Scartig Lynn, another blacksmith who had been, his file mentioned him as being somebody who was good at constructing mines, so again, I think you see all these nodes that are interconnected in the county. Uh, and Gaffney was the only soldier, only one of two soldiers that was prosecuted uh, for what happened in Kerry. Uh, and obviously, he was hanged in 1924. Okay, do I? No, still again, <laughs> still no. Um, we have a question down here from this gentleman. Just briefly, I want to abuse my position to say, with regard to the question of were reprisals and atrocities and so on effective, you can say that. You can also say that, I think, with regard to the official executions, to a degree, it did intimidate people. But I would, look, I would say look at the regional variations. So like in, in Kerry and also in Dublin in March 23, you have a big spike in reprisals. 
Um, it doesn't happen in Cork, and the civil war ends just the same way. And the other thing I'd like to say is, yes, there's all these horrible reprisal killings, but the average action of the National Army in this period is arrest. It's far, far more common than killing. So you have around 12,000 arrested, as opposed to you know, several hundred killed. Now, we have a question down here. Uh, yeah, um, I'm just on, it's just touched on there about the land question. I mean, unlike that was said earlier, um, there was industrial unrest and there was um, land unrest throughout this period. And both the IRA and the Free State were in opposition to the farm labourers. It's interesting, I think you said all those ones who were involved in the IRA there who were killed were um, farmers. And the farm labourers were in direct opposition to the farmers. And the IRA, if you take a guy like John Joe Sheehy, he said they were taking advantage of the situation, the farm labourers. This is when the, the land trouble went into the Civil War. And he said anybody with a claim um, from an ancestor who had been evicted was sticking the boot in. I mean, that's literally what he said. So, I mean, my question is then, is there a crossover? Like, Kiel Flynn, as it happens, was a centre of land agitation around 1919, 1920. And are there links then leading on to these guys? I mean, most of them are the farmers. The farm labourers around there, how did they stand on the situation? And I'll just ask you, really, those links that went, went into the Civil War. Because land was very much part of what was going on as well, I would say. OK. So, who wants to take that one? Okay. Um, it's, it's hard at that micro level to get a feel of what individual people in that community are feeling about everything like land. Yeah, but you're right, you know, all across Kerry, um, as, at, as in several counties all across Ireland, there is that land agitation in the back. But like you said, it's not about the small, the tenant farmers anymore. It's about those that felt on the margin because, because the, the land wars and the resolution of the land wars left them still, you know, without, without, without anything, and they're still kind of marginalized. Um, but again, I see where you're coming from in terms of, can you say that the IRA represent an elite within a, a lower middle class bracket, you know, working class bracket. Um, again, I suppose a lot more research needs to be done at, at, at a macro level like that. But I mean, I can understand and appreciate your point of, of of, of, you know, the IRA representing something that doesn't maybe represent, even at a local level, the, um, you know, so many of, of those, which would be a kind of rural working class. I don't know if Arson or Dahi has anything else to say? As regards, uh, it's, 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 it doesn't answer uh, to the land question and the tensions that might have arisen from that. But when I make the point that they were farmer's sons and, and uh, what, uh, latitude this gave them, why they were overrepresented in this group. Um, it's from the point of view that as farmers' sons, uh, they were their job gave them discretion and gave them flexibility where they could be off if operations were being carried out at night. They could be off doing this at night, uh, and other family members could take over the jobs that they would do on the farm. So it gave them flexibility uh, and it gave them discretion. And one thing that comes out of the files when I look at them, um, when you look at the list of people uh, from that group that served on active service units, only two of them uh, were employed uh, at the time. Uh, and both of them, I think, left their jobs previous to go on the run with the active service units. So, being a farmer's son or an agricultural worker seems to be one of the only occupations that people could do whilst being on active service. Uh, so that, that's sort of the connection there. I just, I, sorry, Ursula, yeah, just sure. cut you off briefly. Uh, Dahi, is there, under, is there kind of a class basis to the people who suffer property damage, do you find, in the Civil War? Um, I, I think to, to a degree there is. There's a class basis in terms of uh, how successful you are in, in, in getting money uh, for... Uh, for your claim, but I suppose just touching on the on the last question, um, it's really important that we talk about the deeply traumatic events in Kerry and elsewhere, um, where there is loss of life and what happens to those families. But it's also equally important that we do not um, only view the civil war uh, through that lens. Uh, that there are important uh, aspects of the period, uh, important aspects of trauma and suffering. Um, tensions at a local level, land tensions in particular, uh, that we need to tease out. And uh, fortunately, the tools to do that in terms of the archival sources are now there. 
Um, I think they will get even stronger in years to come when the 1926 census is made, is made available in a few years' time. So in one sense, I see sort of a lot of the wonderful research that's going on at the moment. It's a beginning, and we're going to know an awful lot more um, about what goes on in Kerry and elsewhere at an intensely local, granular, and kind of micro level. Okay, I'm going to take uh, three people with their hands in the air, and I'm going to take three questions at once, if we can, because we have only five minutes left. So, uh, you first, sir, please. Um, on the hypothesis that was pre delivered there, was the civil war more brutal, vicious, or protracted in Kerry than any other place? I believe the decisive answer to that is simply yes, for the simple reason that uh, with up to 10,000 uh, personnel army in, the com in Kerry almost at the time, and that's almost the strength of our army today in 2023. And furthermore, um, I see my, my, that in our own village, small village of Brasna, we had 18 national army billeted in a small village, 18 of them. They were mostly 18 years of age as well. They were from Connemara and the Arden Islands. Now, uh, on this day, 100 years ago, one of them, a Lieutenant Ryan, highly connected, shot himself in a pub in Brasna. He was connected to Colonel Hogan, and Colonel Hogan's other brother was P.J. Hogan, the Minister for Agriculture. He actually got cracked up after, which is a kind of a, not the nicest way to say it, due to the killing of Captain Kai just down the road a few days beforehand on the Free State side, and another soldier died as well, and uh, Dinny O'Connor on the, on, 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 the, on, the, on the Republican side died. So I believe in a very small incident, in a small area that I have mentioned within days, and it happens to be the centenary of left and right today, uh, I believe, which is hardly even documented mm -hmm. and multiplied in several places that uh, in the argument for the hypothesis that the civil war was more vicious, brutal, and protracted in Kerry, I believe it was. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And uh, two more people. So, gentlemen up here, I'm going to take your question. Uh, Connor Joy Beaufort. My question is for Dahi, and I suppose stems from my own ma uh, master's dissertation, which looked at the experience of Kerry's. Protestant minority from 1916 to 1923. So I would have looked at the compensation files submitted to the Irish Grants Committee for Southern Loyalists. And with respect to the Irish Grants Committee, when looking through these, those files, I was constantly, I suppose, trying to gauge the extent to which a claimant was overstating their loyalism in order to gain compensation versus those who were genuinely sincere in their loyalist beliefs. So I suppose, Dahi, how do you as a historian handle these types of issues with these compensation files when navigating through your own research? Thank you very much. I'm going to take one more very quickly then. There's a gentleman just down here, a few rows down there. I'm going to give you one question each, folks, I think. Yep, this gentleman here. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, Stephen Fuller's association with Fianna Fáil. Now, uh, uh, did not Stephen Fuller uh, join on the public uh, at some stage, as he proposed Kathleen O'Connor, the candidate that uh, contested her father's seat, Johnny Connor TD, well known here in Tralee, who was, who was killed in a car crash on his way back from the Dáil. Um, it was Stephen Fuller that proposed her for election. Thank you very much. Okay, so, uh, Orson, I'm going to ask you quickly the first question. So this is about the idea that the civil war in Kerry was far more vicious. And the gentleman's point, I think, was about the volume of National Army soldiers here and the density of incidents in small places. Uh, yes, uh, I think you alluded to it earlier in your own uh, talk, uh, this, this idea that uh, the National Army were initially primarily composed of the Dublin Guard, uh, that they were then joined by the first Westerns who also had a reputation or gained a reputation throughout the conflict for, for brutality. But there, there was a high concentration of National Army soldiers in Kerry. Uh, but, but I think that was necessary, or, or the National Army felt that it was necessary to try and, um, to try and basically subjugate the county to, 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 to law. And you also had a lot more difficulty with the fact of the terrain, uh, the mountainous areas, and even until late in the conflict and even after the conflict was finished, uh, there were reports that there were still parts of Kerry where irregulars could move freely about. Okay. So uh, I think that the, the high degree of numbers w w was felt necessary to, to 
to, to try and bring the county under control. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dahi, I'm going to move on to you. The question is about the Protestant minority and their claims for compensation. Um, thanks for that question, Connor. Um, I'm going to answer your question slightly differently. I think the, the question of loyalty and uh, when you're seeking money is actually really important. Um, and different loyalties are rewarded at different times, uh, depending on the compensation scheme that you're using. So your uh, loyalty, or at least your non-active hostility to the Free State Government uh, is very important in 1923 if you want to be successful, because the guards investigate. And if you, I mean, you, you can have Republican sympathies, absolutely, but if you are an active supporter, or if you took active steps to oppose the government, then you're automatically excluded. Uh, and then you could make the same argument in the 1930s. One of the first pieces of legislation that Fianna Fáil introduced when they are in government on their own in 1933 is a second Damage to Property Compensation Act, and they open it all up again uh, to Republicans. So people who uh, feel that they missed out on the earlier schemes, uh, whether that's the Grants Committee that you've looked at and Jimmy Clark has looked at, or, or the, the schemes 922, you have a kind of a third chance uh, where your loyalty as a Republican is recognised. Okay, and yes, uh, Richard, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are you aware of Stephen Fuller uh, and his association with Clan the Public? Then? No. <laughs> no. Okay. No. no as, as far <laughs> as always, there, yeah, that's always. As the far point. as I know, um, he stayed with Fianna Fáil. I mean, he might have had a, a, a break at some point to go there and go back. But I mean, there's, I mean, I think the, the esteem he was held with in Fianna Fáil was seen in the early 1970s when you know he's presented with a gold watch for his years of dedicated service. The minister, I don't think the T-shirt came, but certainly the um, ministers, several ministers came down to present that to him. So he was he was Fianna Fáil true and true anyway. Okay, so we're, we're just a little bit over time, but not very much. So I want you to join with me in showing our appreciation for our great panelists in this panel.